For several decades as an artist, I have been mining older technologies to shed light on our social relations and our conflicted relationship with machines. In 1994, I discovered the 19th century pneumatic physiologies of Etienne Jules Marais. One of Marais' innovations was the earliest cardiovascular imaging. And medical imaging saved me from an aortic aneurysm in 1995. This personal connection to Marais' work led me to make a multi-chamber heart simulation. And during the following decades, my art installations explored Marais style measurement extended to measuring participants' social interactions, most cogently with conservation of intimacy. It's early March 2022, and a friend sent this image of a phone autograph, the first device to record speech by drawing sound waves. Would I be interested in getting it to work? This was only a visual replica, and I wondered what factors were most critical to get it working. On the internet, I found the patent drawings of the inventor, Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville. He used a sheepskin's membrane a boar's bristle stylus, and what looked like a large funnel. Many of the images I found use wood barrels. If I had to make a wood barrel to get the proper horn, I might as well make my own phone autograph from scratch, I figured. The Victrola guy managed to make a replica work. In one video, he mentions that the barrel was lined with plaster. A quick glance at another video and thinking of an aluminum scrap I might use, I guessed at a size and started to build. But I guessed too large. In making art, my basic technique has been to plunge into a project, and as I work without plans, I keep making mistakes, until one of them opens up possibilities that I can run with. I guessed the wood barrels protected the plaster and the elliptical shape had some significance acoustically. I tried to cut the curved wood boards directly with this jig. It didn't work. But at least I made a marking template. I cut building studs into two foot segments, glued 18 pairs together, partially rip them with a 10 degree bevel, mark them and cut the curves. 30 March. I'm ready to glue the segments into a horn. A small elliptical cone brings the horn down to a hole size for the membrane holder. Now I need a jig to plaster the inside into a symmetrical ellipse. A curved aluminum sweep designed to screed off the plaster into an ellipse also showed me that I have to remove a lot more wood from the inside. The rotary rasp 
took such a deep cut that I lost my grip on the angle grinder as I was reaching deep into the horn. I stepped back quickly and watched the grinder madly cavorting inside the horn as I fumbled with the cord to unplug it. After calming down, I got out my speed control and then the grinder through that. Whew. I'm testing and marking and grinding and 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 testing. I used two coats of white glue as a bonder, laid in fiberglass drywall tape and started plastering. I have no pictures of this frustrating and tedious phase. Although I used baking powder to slow the plaster set, the sweep didn't work as a screed, but as the plaster was setting, it did work to scrape out an ellipse. 19 April. The wood absorbed water from the plaster and expanded. The plaster shrank as it dried and pulled away from the wood. The wood didn't shrink. To fill the gaps, I injected a foaming urethane adhesive. Why did I take this on? It's been over a month of frustration and I still don't have a horn. I should have made an elliptical core I could plaster over and then cover that with a wood barrel. So I wasted even more time and effort making a better sized smooth core. But it was too late to start over. I added front trim to the horn I had. 7 May. These membrane holder components allow quick changes and adjustable tension. Not knowing what was essential, I thought I might need adjustability. The entire unit attaches to the back of the horn. I need a drum. I have four inch pipe in plastic and iron, but nothing in the shop is larger. I only need a foot of six inch or larger pipe, but the suppliers are selling it in 10 foot sections for $400. I do, however, have a hollow decorative pine column with a six inch base. 12 May. What the hell? I'll make the whole damn thing out of wood. Because the column was tapered and the glue up was terribly asymmetrical, it was hard to center the end caps. But I finally got it. Now I'm turning and sanding and painting and turning and sanding and painting and turning and sanding and painting and turning and sanding and painting. I had to keep removing most of the finishes I had tried and finally settled on a lacquer to get a lot of coats in a few days. 31 May. I added a balance point yoke, another for the elevation screw, and a link pair of maple horn supports. 4 June. The final shaft and bearing system. I raised the horn, made a handle, raised bearing supports, and found a plywood panel to mount everything. 7 June. This is when I heard about Dima, and because my parts look so much like the engraving, I sent in a talk proposal. Ha! Huh. Like Ruth Brown saying, I think I made my move too soon. 9 June. I couldn't reach the drum crank while speaking into the horn, so... Twenty four June twenty nine June six July Additional membrane holders for even faster change outs six July Seven July. Hello, hello, hello. I yes, no, no, yes, yes. Just
Despite several attempts yelling into the horn, I strained to see evidence on the smoked paper. Except for these blips. Maybe they are audio waves, or maybe buckled paper. We'll never know, because the paper smoking had melted the lacquer and glued the paper to the drum. And now I'll have to refinish the drum. And make a new one, just for smoking the paper. 11 July. Checking for stylus movement. Twenty July. The third paper smoking took two hours. A final run out elimination on the working drum in situ. 21 July. Dave, Norman, and Paul, three friends from the Exploratorium, came by. We ran many experiments. There are no images, but trust me, it was a great day. We didn't see any waveform results until I looked the next day. There were tiny sine waves in the tracings of different frequencies. And that different frequencies might correspond to Dave, ah, 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 in a tone scale through a plastic tube resting against the membrane. 23 July. I made up some different membranes, tried a dial gauge on a membrane, a tone generator playing through a speaker in the horn, and tape tracing paper to the drum installing a drum skin center membrane and a thicker lateral stylus, I was ready for the next test. 25 July, second test. July. Examining the tracings, I can see waveforms, but as Paul pointed out, they are uniformly sinusoidal and are likely to be just the resonant frequency of my apparatus. Besides, their amplitude is disappointingly small. 2 August. It's been five months and little to show. I wheeled the phone autograph outside for a last test and some sunshine. I can see nothing here beyond the noise of the stylus on the paper. I certainly made plenty of mistakes on this project, but nothing I could use for a socially interactive artwork has emerged. Although I didn't spend much money on this phone autograph, I certainly wasted a lot of time and energy. And the few tracings I got are nothing like what Scott submitted to the Society for the Encouragement of National Industry. This phone autograph is not typical of my art projects. I was attracted by Scott's effort to measure meaning in images of speech. 
Then I got lost in the frustrating obsession to reproduce some of Scott's results. Most of my previous work has focused on social interaction and the phonautograph is a largely solitary device. I never got the technology to work well enough to suggest anything meaningful for me. So I'm going to pack this project away, but I'm not sure where. I don't have any room left in storage. Maybe I should try a smaller membrane first. <laughs>